Uh, it's my honor to present Dr. Dan Fulton, a, uh, an undergraduate product of our own Iowa State. And then uh, uh, he did medical school in uh, Iowa, University of Minnesota. Minnesota, and then uh, internal medicine, I want to say, in, in Minnesota. Hennepin. Hennepin County, excellent, and uh, stomping grounds of my lovely wife. And then finally, infectious disease at uh, University of Iowa, Go Hawks. So uh, without further ado, I'm giving him the microphone and uh, dispatching this patient. I'll catch up with you all later. Thank you, Dr. Fulton. I'm Dan Fulton. There we go. Hello. Um, thank you all for coming. So uh, we are going to talk about antibiotics today. And um, I'm an infectious disease doctor, so I spend a lot of time thinking about antibiotics. And uh, when we started talking about doing um, this talk, I thought it would be a good opportunity to review um, how I like to think about antibiotics, which is not always how I think students learn about antibiotics or how... Um, uh, maybe other people think about antibiotics and maybe provide some tools for how to think about these antibiotics um, for your practice as you go forward. So um, uh, I don't have any disclosures, uh, except that I would say that I, I am trained in um, what I would consider science as a way of knowing. So um, science has a method, it has a way of knowing, and there are other ways of knowing. And the reason that's important is that when people think about antibiotics, they think about uh, this guy, um, Sir Fleming. Alexander Fleming uh, is credited with discovering, uh, there we go, um, uh, Dr. Fleming is up there too, um, with discovering uh, penicillin. And um, it's kind of an interesting story. Basically what happened is he was really bad at doing dishes. And uh, he went on a vacation and he left a whole bunch of dirty dishes in his lab. And when he came back, he found this dish that was full of mold. And I don't know if you've ever had that experience. I'm sure I've never had moldy anything in my kitchen. Um, but what he noticed with this uh, mold was that none of the bacteria that were supposed to have grown on that plate would grow anywhere near that mold. So that mold, called penicillium, was creating some substance that was keeping bacteria from growing near it. So um, he was kind of interested in this, and he discovered it, and he named it penicillin. He didn't know what it was. He didn't know if it was an enzyme or a chemical or a protein. or uh, And that's kind of where it stopped. So it's kind of interesting. We always think about Fleming when we think about antibiotics. Uh, he discovered penicillin, and then he stopped. He didn't take it any farther than that. That was in 1929. Uh, and then um, some new researchers uh, picked up on this idea, and it was right around the time that pharmaceutical um, houses and companies were starting to get a lot of financial traction. So they got uh, kind of this uh, bolus of capital from uh, these companies to look into penicillin more. But what I mean by um, science as a way of knowing is science claimed antibiotics and penicillin starting in 1929. But people have been using substances for their antibiotic properties for millennia, whether it's honey on wounds for antibiotic properties or even molds being used for maybe their antibiotic properties. So there are many ways of knowing that are used in other ways, and I'll be talking about what I consider the scientific way of knowing. So um, the story really breaks open in 1942. There was a young woman who had had a miscarriage, and after her miscarriage, she uh, developed sepsis from strep. So when we think about sepsis now, we think about somebody coming in with a fever, and they're very sick, and we give them antibiotics, and hopefully they get better. Um, but before we had antibiotics, things like this would develop over weeks. We think about people with infections needing to be treated immediately. But back then, people would have fevers for days to weeks and their immune systems would be fighting and uh, in her case she was losing the battle. She was getting worse over time, uh, fevers of 106 every day and they didn't think she was going to make it. So here's where there's some interesting coincidence. So there was another patient in the same hospital named Dr. Fulton <laughs> and uh, Dr. Fulton here um, it turned out had done his training in at Oxford and uh, had moved to Connecticut to continue some of his research, mostly on uh, neuron disease. But he had trained in the lab of these two other fellas, um, uh, 
One was named Dr. Flory and one was named Dr. Chain. And Dr. Flory and Chain were the researchers that really picked up where Fleming left off. And they had worked and worked and worked over the course of 10 years to finally start to isolate this product known as penicillin. And so because this patient, Dr. Fulton, who, um, you know, gone are the days of patient privacy, I guess, uh, back then, somehow knew about her case, um, he reached out to his old colleagues and uh, they were able to send one tablespoon of penicillin from England to Connecticut. That was 50% of the world's supply of penicillin. So that's uh, Dr. Chain and Dr. Flory uh, there at the bottom. So um, uh, they slowly gave Miss Miller this penicillin and she survives. And she was, uh, this wasn't ever in doubt. I mean, she was dying and the penicillin really um, brought her back and she lived another 57 years. Um, I sometimes wonder what would have happened if she would have had an allergy to penicillin. <laughs> the world would be different because we would have said, no, this is too dangerous. We can't do this. So in some ways, uh, we really luck out. Um, she wasn't the first person treated for, uh, with penicillin. They had done some eye drops for kids with gonorrhea in their eyes. There was another guy that had been pricked by a thorn bush treated with penicillin in England who didn't survive. But she was the first person that really was not going to survive that then did because of penicillin. Um, so, you know, that's great. Antibiotics save lives. I do think it's important before we move on, though, to say that um, penicillin was first used in 1942. And this is a graph that shows uh, the death rate from infections over the prior uh, 50 years. And what I want you to see here is that this line went down dramatically before antibiotics ever started to be used. So what's that about? Well, so that is potable water, that is sanitation, that is some vaccines, um, that is infection control and prevention uh, in healthcare settings. Um, so uh, antibiotics are important, but they are only one piece of a very big puzzle for how we control infections and uh, infection death. Um, you know, really this line is kind of flat since we got antibiotics, although it's really low, you know, so it's antibiotics are important. Um, so over the years, we've gotten a whole bunch of different types of antibiotics from penicillin discovered in 29 to maybe some other antibiotics you recognize uh, there. And we're going to talk about these. Um, but I think the most important thing to know is that as we move farther right on the line, we start seeing fewer and fewer new things coming out. Um, I think another point I want to make is that uh, antibiotics, um, you know, anti means against, bio means life. So we're really killing things. And I think as we've gone forward with antibiotics, we've gotten a deeper appreciation for many of the things we kill, we probably shouldn't. Um, and there are many innocent bystanders in this process of giving antibiotics. Additionally, we talk about antibiotics, we usually use that word to mean antibacterials. But there are other antibiotics besides antibacterials. In fact, we kill fungus and viruses and protozoans and parasites with these two. That all kind of falls under the headline of antibiotics. But what we're going to focus on today is just antibacterials. Um, this is the University of Minnesota. And this building is located on Fulton Street because it turns out that Dr. Fulton then went to the University of Minnesota where I ultimately trained. So it seems like a very small world. I would love it if I could tell you some genealogic connection to that guy. I have no idea. So I, I don't know if I'm related to him or not. Um, when I went to medical school uh, and learned about antibiotics, what I remember from those classes is that they were taught by pharmacists. And um, that's important. Pharmacists are drug experts. Uh, but I also think the approach of a pharmacist is different than the appro approach of a clinician. Um, the focus, I think, and important to know, is that uh, antibiotics, when they're given, they go into the body and they spread out. Um, so that's called the pharmacokinetics, the PK. And then the body acts upon those antibiotics, and the antibiotics do things once they get there. So that's pharmacodynamics. So PK, PD, we refer to. And that's all really hard to keep track of for me. I feel like I look this up every day. So 
in terms of things to memorize, I don't memorize these things. It's, it's worthwhile just looking up your dosing with kidney function or talking with your uh, pharmacist. They're very helpful. Um, it is important, though, to know that if you give the wrong dose of an antibiotic, it won't work or it will cause toxicity. Um, uh, so kidney function matters, liver function matters, patient's obesity matters, and what their age is matters. When we decide if an antibiotic is active or not, uh, we do testing in a lab against the bacteria. And basically, each bacteria has a concentration of the antibiotic in the blood above which the bacteria doesn't grow or dies. Below that, the bacteria is able to keep going. And if we partially expose the bacteria to an antibiotic but not fully expose it, then the bacteria can develop resistance over time, which we'll talk about. If we give too much, well, then people can get toxicity. Um, I think the other thing that's important to remember about antibiotics, uh, and I alluded to this before, is that there's a lot about the world that we don't know. And so uh, Phil Peterson, who's an infectious disease physician at the University of Minnesota, um, has this uh, 10 rules, and he published a book, actually, for patients. But rule number one is, if it is working, keep it going. And if it's not working, change it. And that's true of uh, antibiotics as well. You know, we measure vancomycin levels, for example, um, but uh, we don't measure levels of other antibiotics. And so when I give, you know, a gram of ceftriaxone to a patient, I'm assuming it reaches a certain level. But every patient is different. And some people rapidly metabolize certain drugs. Other people don't metabolize them at all. Um, so remember that just because a bacteria is supposed to be sensitive to something, it may not work. Also remember that your antibiotics are not acting alone. So uh, Dr. Mike Ohl at the University of Iowa always used to say, talk about the rule of 90-60. If you give your patient the right antibiotic, you have a 90% chance that it will be effective. If you give them the wrong antibiotic, you have a 60% chance that it will be effective. So the question is, well, why would that be? I hear often that, well, my patient came in the hospital, I gave them an antibiotic, and then they got better. It must have been the antibiotic. Well, that might be. But the truth is, we do a lot of things in hospitals and in clinics that have nothing to do with antibiotics. The patients rest, they get hydrated, they get other treatments, they take their prescribed medicines as they're actually prescribed when they're in the hospital. And so uh, beware correlation and causation when it comes to antibiotics. If a fever goes away, it might have been the antibiotic, but it might have been something else too. Antibiotics do have downsides. I love antibiotics. Antibiotics save lives. But don't forget they have downsides. So there's allergies. There's bad allergies. People can die from penicillin. Um, people's liver and kidneys and bone marrows can go bad over time with these. I think we are also getting a deeper appreciation for what's called the microbiome over time. All the bacteria that live in your gut. You are 1 trillion human cells and you are 10 trillion bacterial cells in your body. Isn't that kind of neat? Um, so if we kill them, what happens? Well, um, we cut down the forest and we leave an empty field. Well, that empty field gets invaded by an invasive species over time. So that's what C. diff is. C. diff moves in. We all probably get exposed to it from time to time. But if we cut down the forest of our good guys, then that's when you can get the bad guys. And there are longer term effects of antibiotics that we may not even know about, whether it's um, immune regulation um, or other things like irritable bowel syndrome or obesity. Antibiotics do cost money, and these days they cost a lot of money. Um, and I also think that there's a certain sense of a cultural change. You know, it used to be that um, somebody came in and we didn't really know what was going on, and we'd spend more time trying to figure out what was going on. And I think because of the relative safety of antibiotics, now a lot of times we will give an antibiotic and feel like we've done an intervention, and we will stop there while we wait and see. Um, when really, you know, the intervention may not have been what's helpful and we should keep looking. And sometimes I think the evaluation gets a little delayed. So um, I think another cultural thing um, that I find interesting is that we will all die. And one of the final common pathways of death is an infection. And it used to be said that pneumonia is an old man's best friend. And the reason for that is that as people age and get more comorbidities over time, life becomes harder and harder to lead until you get to a point where maybe you get an infection and that infection is the way out. 
when my grandpa died from pneumonia, um, he had been suffering from dementia for years and, and he had really, his life had ended years prior. Um, and for him, it was a real blessing that his family um, was able to intervene before he ended up in an intensive care unit, getting more and more antibiotics, trying to kill this treatable infection um, because really it, in the big picture, it wouldn't have helped him. So uh, those are hard questions um, to know when and how to approach that, that sort of thing. I think sometimes antibiotics makes that harder. Um, we tend to couch the conversation about antibiotics in military terms. So um, we deploy a new antibiotic and then the bacteria over time develop resistance. And um, you can see here that penicillin, it was just about five years after we deployed it that uh, it became resistant. Um, here you can see that sulfa drugs, uh, we actually started using those for treatment before penicillin, they just never worked very well. Um, you know, developed resistance right away. And then here, newer antibiotics, linazolid developed in 99, already resistant, daptomycin just two years later. And that's not all bacteria, but it's a lot of bacteria. So um, that's something that every time we come up with something new, we have to be aware that the bacteria are going the other direction. Um, likewise, although we do have new antibiotics, uh, it's been 40 years since we came up with a new class or type of antibiotic for gram-negative bacteria like E. coli. Um, that's a real problem. It's new classes of antibiotics that really open up doors to different ways of treatment. Our different ways of treating right now are to change the doses or do things in combinations, but um, the pipeline in terms of new things, especially for things like E. coli, there's not a lot going on. So um, the scope of how we use antibiotics is huge. So 55% of everybody that enters a hospital gets an antibiotic. And every day a person is in the hospital, about 75% of those people get an antibiotic. For every day, every patient, 75% are getting an antibiotic. About 30% of those, when we look back and say, did that patient really need that antibiotic or not, are sort of listed as unnecessary. Um, I take a little bit of issue with that because I think it assumes that we have perfect knowledge on the front end, and we don't. And study after study has shown that treating aggressively up front and then rapidly backing off does a lot better for patients than being stingy on the front end, especially when they're really sick. So my message here is not use less antibiotics, but it is to pay attention as you go and be willing to make quick changes as you're going to focus in on treatment. This is also interesting. About 70% of kids have gotten antibiotics by the time they're two years old. There are studies of uh, unreached, I guess they've been reached eventually, but tribes in the Amazon that had never had any antibiotics within their communities. And those folks actually had 30% greater biodiversity of bacteria in their gut than people do in the United States. Even children in the United States that had never gotten an antibiotic. So if you took an antibiotic, your children might not ever have the opportunity to meet a bacteria that lived in your gut because it's gone extinct. And I don't know that we know the big term picture of how that'll affect us over time. So I wanted to talk about antibiotics specifically in terms of what they do treat. And um, when I think about big picture, thinking about infections, I think about three categories of infections. Um, the first are gram-positive bacteria, the second are gram-negative bacteria, and the third are anaerobic bacteria, bacteria that live without oxygen. So here are some examples of gram-positive bacteria. We do a stain in the lab. Uh, if the stain sticks to the wall of the bacteria, it makes it purple. If we wash that stain and it washes out, then the gram stain didn't stick and we call that gram-negative. Anaerobe doesn't really fit with the gram-positive, gram-negative notion because anaerobes can be gram-positive or gram-negative. The key to them is they don't like growing in air, and there are some practical, practical applications in terms of antibiotics we use. So if we could break down the gram-positive category a little bit more, there are three main bacteria that are gram-positives that we treat. We treat staph, we treat strep, and we treat enterococcus. If we could break the gram-negative category down a little more, we treat stomach or gut bacteria, 
We treat Pseudomonas, which is also a gut bacteria, but more resistant. And then we treat these ESBL organisms, which stands for extended spectrum beta lactamase, which will make more sense as we go. Finally, we can break down the, um, the gram-positive bacteria a little bit more. So staph bacteria can be either sensitive to methicillin or resistant to methicillin. And enterococcus can be either sensitive to vancomycin or resistant to vancomycin. So if we were to... Well, so there's a lot of gram positives in the world, and this talk is not meant to help you treat all of them. Um, these are other types of gram positives. Vanco is usually the go-to for those. And then he, here are some of the gram negative uh, enteric bugs, um, like E. coli and Proteus and Klebsiella, but there are, there are lots of these bacteria. Um, this is an interesting bacteria we found recently. The lab is laughing at this one. This one, this, I was going to save this for my fantastic beasts and where to find them, talk number three, but I just could. So is this gram positive or gram negative? Gram negative. So it washed out. You might notice it's got this little spiral shape to it. That's kind of neat. So this bacteria's name is Spirillium, and this causes rat bite fever, which I've always read about, but I've never actually seen a case until a couple weeks ago. Um, so, so here's our spectrum. So uh, if we think back to what's the oldest antibiotic? Penicillin. So what do we use penicillin for now? We use penicillin for strep infections. So, uh, and you know, enterococcus used to be considered a strep until we figured out they were kind of different. So really, from a practical standpoint, we use penicillin for strep. And penicillin is still the best treatment for strep, hands down. Strep uh, fortunately, is not very good at being resistant to penicillin. So even, you know, 70, 80 years later, it's still the best treatment. Unfortunately, staph and E. coli and those types of things used to be sensitive to penicillin, but within a few years of penicillin coming out, they became rapidly resistant. So then we had to change the penicillin and we had to make what's called an anti-staph penicillin specifically. So that's the next one on our list. So that's nafcillin or dicloxacillin. This is kind of confusing. So when we talk about MSSA, methicillin-sensitive staph aureus, uh, we're talking about methicillin, but in the lab, we test oxacillin, but the antibiotic we use is nafcillin. They're all the same thing. It's all the same. I don't know why they use different names. I think they're just different, but it's all the same thing. Nafcillin, oxacillin, methicillin. Um, and then the oral version is dicloxacillin. Those are anti-staph penicillins. Well, you can see that that didn't really help us on the uh, gram-negative side of things. And the other downside to penicillins is your body rapidly metabolizes them. So you have to take it like five, six times a day to maintain a good level. So they thought, well, what if we added an amino group to a penicillin to make an amino penicillin to make it last longer? And so that's where ampicillin and amoxicillin came from. That's where the letter A comes from. That's how I remember it anyway. Ampicillin and amoxicillin are amino penicillins. So they uh, last longer, and that's what we generally use for things like sinusitis or strep throat because it lasts longer. Those picked up a little bit of E. coli uh, uh, effectiveness, but unfortunately that didn't last. The E. coli started to become resistant to... Um, ampicillin over time by creating what I would consider to be a little Pac-Man that comes along and it chews through the beta-lactam chemical ring of the penicillin. Um, that's called a beta-lactam ACE. ACE means it's an enzyme that eats it. So we thought we would get smarter and we started giving a combination antibiotic that includes a beta-lactamase inhibitor. So when we give ampicillin sobactam, also known as unison, or augmentin, amoxicillin clavulanate, that's the same old amoxicillin, but with a beta-lactamase inhibitor to kind of counteract what the bacteria are doing. So you can kind of see this back and forth already between us and the bacteria. Well, that is a lot better for things like E. coli. Um, unfortunately, you can see it still hasn't done anything for pseudomonas, um, which is not uncommon. So then they said, well, what if we develop a better penicillin that's active against pseudomonas? So they created an anti-pseudomonal penicillin called pipericillin. It starts with a P for pseudomonas. Um, they paired that with a beta-lactamase so that it would be active against other things as well. And you can see that's our first pseudomonas active bacteria, 
Uh, you can also see when we add the beta lactamase, we get more reliable anaerobic coverage, uh, either with the augmentin or the, the piptazo. Um, so that's really where the penicillins stop. We don't, we don't have much beyond that. But there are some cousins of penicillins called cephalosporins that still use the beta lactam ring. Um, so the first generation cephalosporin is called cefazolin, and that works a lot like um, nafcillin plus amoxicillin. So it's anti-staph plus some gram-negative and good strep coverage. Second generation, we trade the staph coverage to try and get better gram-negative coverage. So the GI doctors like second generation um, uh, cephalosporins because they cover the gut bugs. The third generation is probably one you've heard of. Um, this is rocephin or ceftriaxone. So you can see this is getting broader spectrum. It gets the staph coverage back. It still covers the gram negatives and it's active against strep. The fourth generation adds the pseudomonas. So you can see we're, we're kind of getting more with each generation of these uh, cephalosporins. And then um, one thing about cephalosporins you should notice is that none of them are active against enterococcus, never. So enterococcus is intrinsically resistant to cephalosporins. Uh, and they're also very bad against anaerobic organisms. So uh, we always have to pair them with something else. You'll also notice that we don't have any MRSA coverage. So methicillin resistant Staph aureus, it's resistant to penicillins, basically. And that was true until about a few years ago, um, 2014, when this new cephalosporin came around called ceftaroline. And this is the first ever beta-lactam antibiotic uh, that uh, was active against staph. So um, in review, a beta-lactam is a chemical structure that fits into the wall of a bacteria at the penicillin binding protein site named for the, the antibiotic that keeps the wall from growing. Um, so bacteria generally fall apart. So these antibiotics kill bacteria. They don't just slow them down, they actively kill them. Um, of course, don't forget that antibiotics only kill bacteria when they're growing. So if you've got a bacteria hibernating on some plastic or hardware in your body, the antibiotics won't help with that. And antibiotics only go where blood goes, which sort of makes sense. So if you've got um, a big abscess in a foot or something, there's no blood flow into an abscess. And so it's hard to get antibiotics in there. So you can give somebody the best antibiotic in the world, but if it doesn't get to where you want it to go, it doesn't do you any good. Um, so the picture on the bottom right is a picture of how that beta-lactamase works. So it, it basically chews up that beta-lactam ring. So here's your beta-lactam ring. The beta-lactamase gets made by the bacteria and it chews right through that and turns it into something that's totally ineffective. So if we block that, then we can keep our, um, our, our things, our antibiotics effective. I skipped over one class here. So these are sort of the, our, our biggest and best antibiotics right now. Uh, and you see them used a lot. So imipenem and miropenem. The reason that we use them is when people are really sick, we don't want to be wrong. And that's, that's one thing I always ask myself when I see somebody with infection is how willing am I to be wrong? If I swing and miss, is this patient going to have time to survive and come around or are we going to lose them? So we, we end up using these broader spectrum antibiotics more up front because we don't want to swing and miss. And so this, this line here of uh, the miropenem and ertapenem and imipenem, you can see covers all the way across. So that's why you see that used a lot for really sick people is we really don't want to miss. One important point for um, the physicians in the group is that ertapenem, even though it's on this list, is not active against pseudomonas. So if you have a pseudomonas infection, ertapenem wouldn't be on your list. So as we keep going, I didn't want to give you these to begin with, but I brought you all some party favors. So maybe if you guys want to help hand these out, I made you some antibiotic cards. Can, I, can you help me? And you can take these home with you. Um, and it's just going to be a summary of this uh, antibiotic spectrum that we're talking about. Um, so let's talk a little bit about antibiotic resistance because so far I've talked to you about the Pac-Man um, but there are other things that we see too with resistance. So here's the little Pac-Man enzyme that likes to chew through antibiotics. This is the scariest one that we have, uh, and we'll talk about why in a minute. 
But there are other ways that bacteria can be resistant to antibiotics. Probably the most common way is a patient that has gotten a lot of antibiotics over time. Um, bacteria that pump the antibiotic out of the bacteria, um, the antibiotic can never get in to where it's supposed to be exposed. So that's called an efflux pump. So you might see that a bacteria is extensively resistant, but you won't see the lab putting a bunch of red flags on it about these Pac-Man, because it's the Pac-Man that make us really worry. Bacteria like this, um, they're not as contagious as the Pac-Man type bacteria. So sometimes the bacteria can pump the antibiotic out. Sometimes the bacteria can change so it doesn't let the antibiotic in. Sometimes the bacteria can change the part where the bacteria or the antibiotic attaches to so that it can't attach anymore. Uh, but it's these, these Pac-Man ones that cause the biggest worry. The reason that the Pac-Man causes the biggest worry, these beta-lactamases, is that bacteria, uh, it turns out, can carry these Pac-Man enzymes on something called a plasmid. So a plasmid is a part of bacteria that it can share with other bacteria. So I usually tell patients that the way bacteria grow is asexually. You've got a bacteria, it gets bigger, and then it turns into two. And now you've got two, and then you've got four, and then you've got eight, and they're just dividing. But it actually turns out that uh, bacteria have sex. And here you can see um, this bacteria, they're, they're uh, flirting a little bit. Here they've started to date. I, I would say here they're definitely married. Um, <laughs> And some things happen here. I, I, you know, they look like they're still together. But what you'll notice is that um, this part of this bacteria, this plasmid, has moved from here and been replicated into this other bacteria here. So if you are carrying a very resistant gene for a really resistant, powerful Pac-Man in this bacteria, and this patient is sitting in your ICU or is sitting in your long-term care unit, and this bacteria is on their Foley catheter, um, this bacteria can start to share uh, this resistance. And it, it doesn't necessarily have to be an E. coli to an E. coli. It can be uh, across species also. So um, these plasmids are, are where a lot of the concern comes. And so here's an example of a patient um, that if you look at the antibiotic options here, there are none. This patient has a totally resistant bacteria. So uh, this is a, a big worry. Uh, and part of the reason why we're talking about antibiotics is we don't want to end up here with our patients. Um, interestingly, this bacteria just had an incredible efflux pump. It was not from one of these transmissible um, proteins. I don't think we've, have we had any CRE so, so we've not had any of these highly resistant plasmid-based resistant organisms yet. Uh, they're definitely in Chicago. They're definitely in long-term care places in eastern Iowa, but they really haven't made it to central Iowa. You might remember the famous Dr. Arbulu. Um, he's seeing about six to seven of these patients every day in Pittsburgh. Um, so, so far, we're lucky. Um, it's a matter of time before they come here. So if we were to move beyond our penicillins and our cephalosporins, um, there are other types of antibiotics out there. So if we focus first on ones that are active against MRSA, um, vancomycin is a very common antibiotic. Then there's something called daptomycin, which is kind of like vanco, except it's active against vancomycin-resistant enterococcus. It's kind of a trick question. Um, that's, BRE is not sensitive to vanco. Um, and then there's something called linazolid. So these are IV type medications uh, that you can use for these more resistant gram positive infections. Not everybody is so sick they need to be in the hospital though. So there's three types of oral antibiotics you can use for MRSA. The first one is Bactrim. The second one is tetracyclines. And the third one is clindamycin. And, and a couple important details about these drugs. Um, the first is that uh, although Bactrim and doxycycline are good for MRSA and other staph, they're only partially active here against strep. And we'll talk about in a little bit why that's important. But remember that Bactrim and doxy are not great strep drugs. Clindamycin is um, good for anaerobes. It kind of jumps the gram-negative section. 
Remember though, it's only about 50 to 60% active against staph. So even though it, it technically covers these, it's also not great. So you need to check your sensitivities as they come back and get cultures. This is kind of a funny drug as tray -NM, You might see this used every once in a while in penicillin allergic patients. This is a gram negative drug only. It doesn't do much for anything else. Aminoglycosides, if you've heard of gentamicin and tobramycin, these are like our gram negative depth charges. The problem is that they're super toxic to the kidneys and to the ears. So people lose their hearing on these drugs. So most bacteria we see are still sensitive to these because we don't use them if we can get by with it. Uh, these drugs get used a lot, quinolones. So Cipro, levofloxacin, and moxifloxacin. Um, you know, these all kind of act in the same way. Traditionally, Cipro is used for in the stomach, below the diaphragm, so for urinary tract infections and, and intestinal infections, and moxifloxacin and levofloxacin are used for respiratory infections. Moxifloxacin has a lot more anaerobic activity uh, than these others. So in a very penicillin allergic patient, you might see moxifloxacin used uh, instead of augmentin. You know, so here's augmentin. If we're trying to do something similar to augmentin, moxifloxacin is a good oral. You'll see the lab checking quinolones against staph. Um, but in general, uh, quinolones should not be used for staph infections. And the reason is that the way quinolones work is they inhibit, inhibit the gyrase gene that helps make uh, DNA. But the problem is, is just one little click of a, of a mutation makes that antibiotic and bacteria become incompatible and resistant. And when you have staph infections, there's a lot of bacteria there. So you're almost guaranteed that a few of them will develop that resistance. So quinolones aren't a great option for staph infections. Macrolides are sort of the antibiotic that everybody gets at least once a year. Um, so this is your Z-Pack. Um, I'm not sure these are really good for anything anymore. Um, strep are about 30 to 40% resistant now. Um, some salmonella and E. coli type bacteria are still sensitive. The main role for z packs and macrolides is for those atypical infections we talk about that cause like walking pneumonia, like mycoplasma um, or chlamydia. Um, and then in the very bottom right here, you'll see this little category, this thing called metronidazole or flagyl. So flagyl is really your anaerobic uh, treatment. So anaerobes are very sensitive to this, to this antibiotic and um, they have not developed much resistance. Uh, there are bacteroides that are resistant to meropenem um, and fortunately still sensitive to metronidazole. So that's the, oh, and then in the lower left, you can see when we talk about atypical pneumonia, pneumonia, there are three classes of drugs that are active against atypical organisms. So that's the quinolones, the macrolides, and uh, the tetracyclines. And the reason is when we say atypicals, what we mean is bacteria that live inside of your immune system. They live in your macrophages. So it's hard for all of these other antibiotics to get to them. So antibiotics only work if they get to where the bacteria are. So these are antibiotics that get into those places and that's why we use them. So for pneumonia guidelines, you'll always see one of these included because we got to treat those types of infections. On the back of your card, you're going to see a lot of caveats and footnotes, which I won't bore you with right now. Remember, this is just a guide. And if you have culture data that has sensitivities, that is true. This is just a guide. So if your culture data says that uh, your strep is resistant to penicillin, even though I told you that never happens, um, I was wrong. <laughs> uh, so use this as a guide. I think this is a really useful teaching tool, especially uh, for students as you see antibiotic changes made. Um, the reason that these get made is, for example, if your patient comes in with sepsis and you need to treat broadly because you don't know what the patient has, you want to treat the gram positives and you want to treat the gram negatives and you want to treat the anaerobes. Um, what you would want to do is pick some combination of these antibiotics that would treat all of those things. So hence the very famous vancozosin combination. You can see here that vancomycin treats all of these gram positives and zosin treats all of these gram negatives and the anaerobes. So that's where that combination comes from. We had a joke in my residency that interns give vanco and zosin. Uh, second year residents give vancomycin and meropenem. Same thing, it's the same coverage. Uh, 
third year residents, they give vancomycin, cefepime, and metronidazole. Same coverage. You're treating the same spectrum of bacteria, but in totally different ways. Um, daptomycin gets a little asterisk here that's listed on the back of your chart because it's not active in the lung. So that's bad for a septic patient. If you, if you don't know why they're sick and they might have pneumonia, which everybody's x-ray in the ER looks like they have pneumonia, daptomycin is not a good upfront choice because it's not going to be active in the lung. Linazolid you can't use if your patient's been on an antidepressant because it causes a weird drug interaction. So linazolid is also not a great first option in part because so many people are on those drugs and in part because it's also not as good when bacteria are in the blood. So if you kind of take a step back, the reason septic people all get vancomycin plus something else is because vanco kind of is our best run-of-the-mill catch-all drug for the gram positives. The problem with vanco is it's a huge molecule. So when you're trying to get that into a place of infection or into a bacteria to kill bacteria, it just doesn't work very well. It might work kind of, but it doesn't work very well. And so, for example, treating a strep infection with Vanco, well, it'll kind of work. It's going to take a lot longer to work, and your patient's going to be a lot sicker during that time. So um, one clue that you can take is that we at Mary Greeley keep track of something called an antibiogram. So this is a production of the lab. We thank you very much for doing this, you guys. Um, labs in the front here, you guys. Can we give them a round of applause? Thank you, thank you, thank you. We can't do anything with you guys thank, without you. Thank you. Um, so anyway, so we keep track of what are our bacteria sensitive to. And so, for example, um, even though I told you that E. coli is sensitive to uh, ampicillin sobactam, you can see at our particular facility, it's only 60% active. So maybe that's not a good drug until you get your sensitivities back. Uh, likewise, levofloxacin against E. coli, only 75% effective. So maybe not a great first choice if you've got other options. Um, so it's worth uh, looking at this if you're trying to decide what to start uh, because it can give you a little bit of a clue up front. Um, we do the same thing in the urine and we see increased resistance in the urine actually um, because bacteria like to live in the urine. So we're going to talk about case. Um, 58-year-old comes in with a, a urinary stone, um, and he's in shock, and he's really sick, uh, but he's not immunocompromised. Um, he has been on antibiotics recently for sinusitis, and that was actually found to be MRSA, and he's gotten a bunch of Bactrim uh, for that. He also has had prostatitis with some E. coli. So when you're trying to figure out what's wrong with your patient, it's always good to look back at past cultures and see what they had. Um, in addition to getting a stent in there to control the source, um, you would maybe want to start um, some antibiotics. And let me say here that source control is so important. We think about antibiotics as curing infections, um, but if you don't control the source of an infection like a blocked kidney or a big abscess, um, uh, antibiotics don't get into abscess or blocked kidneys very well. So your source control is really first. Um, so you're trying to decide what to start. So he's had MRSA in the past, so you'd want to treat for MRSA. He's got E. coli in the past, um, and he's very sick. So you do not want to be wrong. So like we talked about, you might, might start vancomycin, um, and then you'd want to start something with it. So maybe you do the zosin or the miropenem. Um, or for E. coli, maybe you do ceftriaxone because he's never had that pseudomonas but you really don't want to be wrong. So maybe you don't, maybe you want to use some pseudomonas treatment too. So you give him vancomycin miropenem and he stabilizes. And then the cultures grow this gram negative rod. What used to be, we had to wait another day or two to get more information. Um, but now we get this immediate PCR test within an hour or two that tells us what the bacteria is. So now we know it is E. coli. Ta-da. So we know we can stop the vanco because that's not treating E. coli. And if we look at our E. coli um, sensitivities here, we wouldn't want to switch them to unison. That's no good. And we don't want to use Cipro yet either. But we could narrow our spectrum and switch just to Rocephin. So you switch them to ceftriaxone, and E. coli does eventually grow in the lab. Thank you, lab. You guys are great. Um, and uh, then you get these sensitivities back. And what you see is, well, he'd been on a lot of Bactrim, and it turns out over time uh, we selected for resistant E. coli. Um, 
But this bacteria is very sensitive to some good oral antibiotics um, like ciprofloxacin, which is 100% bioavailable. We're close to it. So, um, so you can switch them to Cipro uh, and then send them home on oral ciprofloxacin. Um, well, I cheated. I went ahead. So you switch them to IV and you're going to send them home on oral, but then the stewardship committee calls you and says, well, couldn't we just go to oral right away because it's so bioavailable and you don't have to give IV because it's so bioavailable and uh, that's easier on the patient and it's easier for nurses and it's less expensive. So stewardship is helping you out here. Um, so I wanted to talk about our stewardship uh, very quickly and Gary is here. Thank you. Gary's our uh, lead steward. Thank you for all your work. Um, so stewardship is the right treatment, the right patient, the right time at the right dose for the right duration. And all of these things work together um, to make sure that we're not uh, underusing or overusing antibiotics. Um, a lot of this has to do with picking the right antibiotics, but it also has to do with preventing infections to begin with. So we have an infection prevention team here that also helps us. Leanne is here. Thank you, Leanne, for all your work. Um, uh, uh, helping prevent infections is the best way to use less antibiotics. Um, We've been uh, tracking what we've been doing with uh, stewardship over the course of the last five years now. And I think this is probably the most important slide. Um, our grand total antibiotic usage over five years has uh, dramatically decreased. And when we compare our institution to our peer institutions, we're dramatically below their antibiotic usage. So um, I see that as a real uh, victory for the stewardship program and infection prevention because that means fewer side effects uh, and better outcomes for our patients. Um, here's case two. Something's wrong here. <laughs> this is a 62-year-old that has cellulitis. He had some lymphedema at baseline, swelling of his legs at baseline, and had some nausea and vomiting. And there's no pus here. It's just a big red leg. So uh, in an outpatient clinic, he started on Bactrim and then he gets worse and then he gets admitted and he starts on Vanco and then he gets worse and then infectious disease gets consulted because he's not getting better on Vanco. And this is a story that we hear time and time and time again. And the reason is that everybody's worried about MRSA. So we give Bactrim to treat MRSA, but it turns out that non-purulent cellulitis, no pus, is caused by strep. 95 out of 100 times. And I told you that Bactrim isn't very good for strep. And Vanco is not a very good antibiotic at all. So what we do with a patient like this who's now failed two antibiotics is we put them on penicillin and they rapidly get better. Um, and you can see penicillin is still our treatment of choice for strep infections. Penicillin has a lot of fluid in it though. So sometimes people who have heart problems or heart failure will end up using ANSEF instead just because it has less volume but really penicillin would be our best treatment. So here's something slightly different. So this guy's had uh, MRSA infections in the past. He's got some CKD history, kidney problems, and he's got this abscess here. So you're gonna culture it. You're gonna release the pus with some IND with uh, Dr. Vandenberg doing surgery for you or something. And, um, and then you gotta start an antibiotic. Um, so which antibiotic would you start for somebody like this. Um, he's septic, so you don't want to give him an oral antibiotic. Um, you might want to give him vancomycin, except his kidneys don't work very good. Um, so there's this newer drug called ceftaroline, which you might be seeing us using more and more. This is our beta-lactam that's active against MRSA. It doesn't cause the same kidney problems, um, and it's a beta-lactam. It works on the wall of the, of the bacteria. So I think this is actually going to end up being the go-to for most MRSA infections in the future, as long as it's sensitive. Um, this has been around a couple years. Um, it's approved for skin and soft tissue infections and pneumonia. There's only about a 1% resistant rate, um, and it's good for purulent cellulitis. So when there's pus or pneumonia when you're worried about MRSA. There is some downside, about 15% of people will get low white blood cell count the longer you use this drug, and any antibiotic can cause C. diff. One important thing, just as an aside, every new antibiotic that you see, not every, but most of them, you're always going to see that they're approved for skin and soft tissue infection first. Why is that? Well, all you have to do to get an antibiotic approved is make sure that it's not worse than the antibiotic that we used to use. Well, it turns out that if you get cellulitis and you elevate your leg, it might get better on its own. So when we compare antibiotics to antibiotics, well, we can say ceftaroline is no worse than vancomycin, probably because 
it wasn't that hard to prove it worked to begin with. So when companies are trying to get their drugs approved, they always start with cellulitis because that's the lowest bar. But the higher bars are things like pneumonia or sepsis, um, intra-abdominal infections, because those are harder to study um, and have higher stakes. So ceftaroline um, is already on your, your card there. So that's one of our MRSA drugs. So here's another case, a 35-year-old with a history of depression with an armpit abscess. So Dr. Mannenberg has to come in again and open this one up. Um, and it grew MRSA, but it's resistant to all these oral antibiotic options. Well, you could think about using linazolid, but remember about that antidepressant problem. So you can't use linazolid. So you say, well, we got to bring you into the hospital, buddy. And he's like, it's Friday. I feel fine. I, wh why do I have to come in the hospital? Well, um, there is an option for folks in this situation. First, you could do nothing. Just by Dr. Vanberg's IND, he's got an 80% chance of being fine. But that's a 20% chance of not being fine. So um, there's this new class of antibiotic called Dalbavancin or Aritavancin. You're going to see more and more of these being used. This is attractive for the ER. It's where the company wants it used, is in the ER. Uh, because it's a long-acting vancomycin. You give this infusion one time, and it's like being on vanco for a week. So you could give this to this guy and send him home and have him follow up in clinic on Monday or Tuesday, make sure he's doing better. And it's essentially like he's on IV antibiotics that whole time. The downside is that um, it sticks around a long time. So if they have an allergy, that can be a problem. Um, the Aritavancin takes three hours to infuse. So we tend to use more Dalbavancin. Um, the challenge I see with this drug is if somebody's sick enough that they need IV antibiotics, it is a very narrow type of patient that doesn't need to be in the hospital and get hydrated and you know, get pain control and everything else. So um, using this as an outpatient, is, it's a very narrow um, window of patient is sick enough they need an IV antibiotic, but not sick enough they need to be in the hospital. I think this drug or these drugs would be really helpful going forward for longer or deeper types of infections that need longer treatment. They're not approved for that right now, and there's anxiety about using them in that way. But for people that have like a heart valve infection or a prosthetic joint infection, imagine if we could just give them an antibiotic once a week, and the rest of the time they don't need a PICC line in, um, they don't need to take pills every day, they just come in once a week for their infusion. Um, I think we'd see uh, better adherence and better outcomes. And so those studies are ongoing and starting to trickle out. The company's not doing those studies. The company did their skin and soft tissue infection study, it's approved and they're done but um, other universities are now trying to look at some of these deeper seated infections um, and having pretty good outcomes. So aritavancin and dalbavancin on your card would sit there right where vancomycin sits, um, but they're just long acting. This is a 72 year old with a urine infection. Um, she's had a lot of urine infections over time, but she's not sick, no fever, no flank pain, not nauseated or vomiting but she has this E. coli that grows that's resistant to all these oral antibiotics. So you recommend hydration and probiotics and cranberry supplements and topical vaginal estrogen, which are the mainstays of UTI prevention in postmenopausal women. But what antibiotic do you want to give? Well, you could bring her into the hospital. That's one option. Or you could use this other antibiotic called phospholmycin. This is actually a really old antibiotic that's been repurposed now because it's very effective against gram-negative uh, infections. Um, Unfortunately, we don't have a sensitivity test for it, so it's hard to know if the bacteria is sensitive or not. Uh, but here you can see in research studies that um, E. coli has really good sensitivity of 100%, and even some pseudomonas, you know, 60 to 80%. So this is actually a first-line treatment for uncomplicated cystitis in women, and there's not a lot of uh, resistance to this. Um, so it's one to keep in your back pocket. So that would sit right there on the gram-negative rods. Um, we have four more big groups of antibiotics to talk about. Omatocycline and aravacycline have just recently come out. Um, these are good for more resistant bacteria, mostly gram-positives. The aravacycline is good for gram-negatives. Uh, we have yet to use this even once in our hospital, um, but we do have access to the omatocycline. I don't know that we have a great way to use these right now. They sort of a new antibiotic um, that, that lacks a good reason, um, especially here, because we don't have a lot of resistant bacteria. 
but these are kind of tetracycline, next generation tetracycline antibiotics. It's not a new class, it's just a different type. Dalafloxacin is a new quinolone, same thing. It's more active against more resistant bacteria. It's not a new class. It's approved for skin and soft tissue infections, but again, it's hard to find a very specific way to use this, and we have similar things to use, um, and this is a lot more expensive. So, um, you know, maybe for MRSA treatments someday if we don't have other options, but right now we don't have a lot of uses for that. Lefamulin, this is a new antibiotic that was just approved um, for pneumonia. Um, this is a new class of antibiotic called a pleuromutilin. Um, it's kind of like doxycycline. This will probably get used mostly for gonorrhea. You may have heard that gonorrhea is now extensively resistant to antibiotics. Um, this is probably going to work for that. Um, it's approved for pneumonia. We've never used it here. The last thing, and you might see these or read about these, um, are these gram-negative busting bacteria. So if you think about that super Pac-Man um, enzyme that chews through antibiotics, these are all antibiotics that add the Pac-Man blocker to allow the other antibiotics to work. So these are for those extensively resistant um, bacteria. And I added a new column to our card. These are carbapenemase resistant Enterobacteriaceae, so our, our one that was supposed to go all the way across and work for everything no longer works for these. So this is where those combo gram-negative busters work. Um, we fortunately have not had to use these here um, more than once or twice. These are the ones that Dr. Arbalu is using every day now in Pittsburgh. So these are coming, but for now we haven't had to use them. Um, these aren't a new class of antibiotic. They're, they're just different combinations of old antibiotics. And there's some newer stuff for more resistant bacteria, but I think you can see we're in this kind of vicious cycle of, you know, bacteria become more resistant, we come up with a new thing, they become more resistant, we come up with a new thing. And it's almost like farming where now the weeds are becoming more resistant and they're starting to pop up in cornfields. And uh, what we need to do is have a different paradigm. Um, I'm really interested in some new research that's being done on these things called phages. I don't know if you've had a chance to read about this. So a phage is a virus that attacks bacteria. And it turns out that they've got banks and banks of these phage viruses just kept in storage with the U.S. government um, and different research libraries. And a story has come out recently of this man that had a totally drug-resistant Acinetobacter, but fortunately his uh, wife is an epidemiologist, so he was dying in the intensive care unit slowly because there was no treatment and his body was fighting. Um, but she contacted these phage folks and they basically found a phage that was active against his totally resistant bacteria. They started giving him this phage just like the penicillin was given to Miss Miller back in 1942, not really knowing if it would work. And within a couple of days, he recovered. So this is not an antibiotic. This is using nature against nature um, in a different way. And I think we're going to be seeing more of this as bacteria become more resistant. Um, so I think with that, I'll stop. That's kind of the antibiotic tour. Um, let me, what questions do you have or what comments? Yes, Dr. Uh, Kitchell. Uh, can you just briefly talk about the use of pharmacogenetics? Um, yes, that's not used a lot with infection care right now. There are a few examples I can think of that. Um, where we might see that pharmacogenetics would be we test the patient to find out um, do they have certain things about them that cause them to say rapidly metabolize a drug or not metabolize a drug? Um, or are they likely to be allergic to a drug? Uh, those sorts of things. Um, those aren't used very much currently in um, infection care. Uh, we use it for some HIV related drugs because they can help predict allergies to certain HIV medicines. Um, I'm not aware that they're used much in terms of looking at risk for infection either. Um, so there's not a lot there. Is there something specific you're thinking of? Um, there's not a lot for that uh, yet. Did you have a question? Yeah. On, on NPR yesterday, they were talking about um, a research lab that is using, uh, I guess it's PCR technique, to look for, for resistant genes within the bacteria, uh, antibiotic resistance, and, and being able to turn out whether a bacterium is resistant to such and such an antibiotic within three hours. Yes. So um, that's a great point. I wanted to bring you back to this, um, this slide right here. Uh, 
So um, we are already doing a little bit of that with our biofire assay. So when you um, look at this, uh, let's see. So, so for example, if we found a Staph aureus, this assay would automatically look for a MEK A gene, okay. which if it's present tells us if it's MRSA or not. Okay. Um, there are specific genes for say Klebsiella, which will tell us, is this a carbapenem resistant Enterobacteriaceae, and do we need to start some of those super gram negative busters up front? Um, the, the challenge or the problem with those tests is going to be that bacteria are always developing new DNA ways of resistance. So the company will spend all this money to create one subset, and we tech check for all those subsets and think we're safe, and then the bacteria go around the back door and have a different way of resistance. So I don't know that we're ever going to get past the lab growing these things and testing them and seeing does it work or does it not. But if we can do it right the first time from the beginning, we'll help people. So that's, that's why they're trying to push farther and farther forward with figuring out is it resistant or not. And, and two other questions. Vancomycin is used for, for C. diff, but it's, it's not effective for, for anaerobes. Uh, is, am I ah, missing something good there? Good question. No, thank you for bringing that up. So... On your card, where it says anaerobes, that is, those are the antibiotics that we would reliably use for all types of anaerobes, empirically in the setting of a sick person with like an intra-abdominal process. Penicillin kills a lot of anaerobes. Vanco kills a lot of ana gram-positive anaerobes. But from a practical standpoint, if you had somebody with sepsis where you needed to cover the whole spectrum, Vanco would not be something you would use to treat anaerobes. If you have a specific bacteria that you know is sensitive to that antibiotic, well, then this card is not useful to you. Sure. You go with what it's sensitive to. And then just one other question. We used to see people all the time with um, lymphedema, and they were having recurrent episodes of, of, of strep, uh, lymphedema in the lower extremity or arm or whatnot. Yes. It, it was sensitive to penicillin, but you treat them for penicillin, and two weeks later they'd come back and they had recurrent uh, strep. Do you, do you ever use, were you using, or do you use, what do you, what do you use prophylactically in that, in that situation? Great question. So um, what happens with non-purulent cellulitis from strep is the way I think about it is folks get um, athlete's foot between their toes. So that's a portal of entry for the strep. And then that strep is dividing every 10 minutes. And so because of the extra fluid in their leg, it has all this extra time to create millions of bacteria by the time the immune system's ready to get going to fight it. The bacteria is incredibly sensitive to antibiotics. So you treat them with penicillin, it gets better. So for what we do for those people is give them prophylactic penicillin. They get, it's 250 milligrams twice a day. So it's a low enough dose, they have no side effects, but it's enough that's there that it kills any strep before it gets started. If somebody only gets one of these episodes once or twice a year, what we'll do is we'll give them amoxicillin to keep on hand. And we'll say, take a gram at the moment you have symptoms, call us and let us know and get your leg elevated to let those toxins drain out. So that's called preemptive therapy. The moment you're sick, you start. Prophylactic therapy is treatment you're on all the time. Either one of those approaches work, but if you're getting multiple episodes, then we've had patients that had six episodes in six months, you put them on penicillin and it's gone, it doesn't come back. But then you gotta treat their lymphedema too. You know, you gotta compress their leg and treat their foot fungus and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, Sam. Thanks, very nice talk. Uh, with your Cipro example, um, I know those don't get absorbed orally if you take it with dairy or other divalence. Does the hospital stewardship or keep track of like their dietary, or is that overblown, that side effect that it doesn't get absorbed if you eat it with the wrong things? So should you keep them on IV if that's what you need while they're here anyway, or do they keep track of that kind of thing? Thanks. That's a good question. Um, I think the biggest concern with the divalence would be less dietary. So if you drink a little glass of milk, the amount of total calcium is not as much as somebody that's taking a big magnesium tablet. And so those do get automatically separated, or at least they should be. And Epic actually helps us with that. Um, Gary, can you comment more? Is that something you guys are screening for? We, we get alerts for Yeah, we get alerts for that um, in Epic. I won't say we're a hundred percent in in doing something about it, scheduling things apart, but 
uh, we do get alerts and we do try to try to do that. I would say my rule of thumb for transitioning the orals is they have to have a functioning gut. So if your post-op patient still has a little ileus, they're not eating well, they don't feel right, they're not eating a lot, just keep them on IV. The, the gut has to work to get absorption. Okay, well, thank you all for coming. Really appreciate it.